This is called Palm Sunday. And it's the most important week that we celebrate throughout the year because Palm Sunday is celebrating the most important week in the history of the world. And you're thinking about, you're, you're talking about the most important week in the history of the world. Weren't there other important weeks? Well, one of the weeks that was really important was the week that God created the heavens and the earth in six days. But Palm Sunday is way more important than that. This week celebrate, that we're, this week we're going to be celebrating what Jesus did for every single one of us so that we can be forgiven of our sins, have a relationship with God, and receive the free gift of eternal life. If Jesus never sacrificed his life, suffered, died, and resurrected from the dead, none of us in this room would ever have the hope of being made complete and whole and having the free gift of eternal life. So let's celebrate this week with, with passion, with excitement and intention. How many believe this week you could, we could celebrate with passion and intention and celebration? So this, this, this is what's going to happen. We want every day to count. Today you're here and I'm so proud of you being here. We got six more days after this. Tomorrow on our app, we're going to have a devotion every single day. It's just like 10 minute devotion that you could tune into every morning. You're going to have an opportunity to start off your day remembering what Christ has done for you. Wednesday night, we're going to obviously have our online service. Tune in online. I'll, I would do this. Try to get perfect attendance on everything. Let's make this the, a full week because Jesus fully went through this week dying, suffering, hurting, going through pain for us. Let's engage this week and get to know Jesus in a greater way. And on Friday, we're going to be celebrating or remembering the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ being crucified. That's on Friday. We're going to have a live service here, Good Friday service. Last year we didn't have it. This year we're going to have it right here in the house of God. Let's make sure, let's, let's go even a step further and let's come on Good Friday. And they'll come alone, invite someone. And then on Easter, we have our sunrise service at six o'clock in the morning. Wow, that's a sacrifice for many. But, it's, but I really believe it's one of the most peaceful services you'll ever attend. It's worth it. We start off the service, it's outside that service. We start off the service, it's dark. And while we're worshiping, the sun rises, representing Jesus rising from the dead. We'd love to have you here on our sunrise service at 6 o'clock in the morning. And then we're going to have our 9 and 11 service, our Easter celebration services. This, this place is already full, but it's going to be packed out to overflow. We're going to have overflows inside, outside, everywhere. And we're going to see, most importantly, people come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. How many believe that's going to happen? So let's go ahead and let's look at this scripture here that describes Good Friday. I mean, I'm sorry, um, Palm Sunday. And it's in Matthew 21, verse 1 through 9. And it says this, And Jesus and the disciples approach Jerusalem. They came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with his colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs them and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought, they, they brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him and others cut branches from, from the trees and spread them on the road. 
Jesus was in the center of the procession. And the people all around him were shouting, praise God for the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. So Jesus, this is a story of Jesus entering into Passion Week. By the end of this week, Jesus would go through massive suffering, massive pain. But it all starts off with this, what looks like a big, huge celebration. These people are praising God. They're laying down their garments. They're putting down palm leaves on, on, on the ground. And what laying down the garments meant was this. We're loyal to you. We're submitted to you. We're going to support you. We're going to be there for you. And the palm branches represented victory and success. And many times it would bring out palm branches in these days when they were welcoming a, a king back from war. What they thought, this is what they were praising Jesus for, they thought Jesus was going to come in and be a political leader that was going to overthrow the Roman Empire. Jesus did not stop them from praising him because praising him is the right thing to do because he is God and he is the savior of the world. Now, if he wasn't God, he wouldn't allow the praise. But since he was God in the flesh, he allowed the praise and worship. But isn't it true that people are fickle? That one day they'll be praising you and the next day they could be cursing you? This is what happened later on in that week on Friday. The same people that were, were praising, Hosanna, Hosanna, bless, bless, be the, bless the Lord, praise God. On Friday, they were, they were shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus already knew what was ready to happen. Now we knew that he knew what was ready to happen because the chapter before this is what Jesus said in Matthew 20, 18 through 19. And the question we're going to answer, what was Jesus' mission in Jerusalem? In Matthew 20, 18, it says this, listen, he said, we're going, to, uh, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man, which is Jesus, he could have said where I am, uh, where I will be betrayed to the leading priests and teachers of religious law. They will, sentence, they will sentence him to die. They will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with a whip, and crucified. But on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. So Jesus brings his disciples together, and he's saying, we're ready to go to Jerusalem, but let me let you know what's going to happen. Now, if I knew what was going to happen in Jerusalem, that I would be beaten, that I would be betrayed, that I would be bullied, that I would be mocked, that I would be stripped naked, that I would be crucified, and that they would kill me, I wouldn't go to Jerusalem. I would go to another city. I would just say, that, I would have just said something like this, thank you, Holy Spirit, for letting me know, exit, stage left. I'm out. But we see in chapter 21, Jesus is approaching the very place that he knew was going to kill him, persecute him, mock him, kill him, crucify him. The question I'm asking, why would he go into Jerusalem anyways? It's important for you to know that Jesus willingly went to Jerusalem. They didn't take his life, he gave his life. It wasn't someone that really took him out, is that he gave his life. So now, question, why? What was Jesus' mission in Jerusalem? To suffer and die. But why would he go to Jerusalem 
if he knew he'd have to suffer and die? And we're going to answer that question today. Number one, because he loved us. Because he loves you. Going into Jerusalem and going through all that pain and all that suffering he was ready to face, he had a mission. And his mission was every single one of us that are here and online and every single one of us that are here right now. Today could be the day that you finally realize God loves me. You need to know that God loves you. And he don't love you because you did anything. He loves you because he created you and he wants you to be his son. He wants you to be his daughter. He loves you. Well, I made so many mistakes and I've sinned and, and it's, this is why you need to know that God loved you while you were still a sinner, messed up. Before you ever thought about living for God, God already loved you. So you would never ever think that God would pull his love from you based on your performance as a believer. God just loves you. Look at John 15, 13, it says, the greatest love a person can show is to die for his friends. The level of love that we have for a person will dis be displayed by the level of sacrifice we're willing to make for them. When you love people, you'll make sacrifices that you wouldn't make for other people. There's some people that you'll sacrifice way more for than others. The level of sacrifice that you're willing to make proves the level of love that you have for them. Think, let's think about that. I'm going to give you an example. Like, I love my wife. So the other day, she asked me to take out the trash. And I did. You might think that's not a big deal, but I don't like doing that. So I pick up that trash and I took it outside. And after I was done, I wanted her to praise me. I felt like a hero, you know, because it was a sacrifice for me. But of course, I cannot compare me taking out the trash with Jesus loving you so much that he would die for you. The highest level of love that you could ever show someone is giving up your life for them. It goes on to read, the greatest love a person can show is to die for his friends. No one has greater love than this. To lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus' death is the ultimate expression of this principle. It's a principle. The deeper the sacrifice, the more love that's shown. So that's what we're doing as a church. We're beginning and doing our best to show love to people right where they're at. We went to Kenya last week, the week before, and we found out that there's orphanages. But then we also found out that there's mamas that have little kids and they have no place to go. There are no women's and children's home in Kenya. So we could not leave Kenya without making the sacrifice of renting a home and bringing a leader in. Now in Kenya, there's a women's and children's home and all we did was show a little love. This kind of love that God shows is unconditional. That means I don't love you because of anything you've done. I just love you. And this is the kind of love that God wants to display through us in this world. So the first reason that Jesus was willing to go into Jerusalem and suffer and die, because he loved us. He was given his life for us. Number two reason because there was no other way to save us 
from the penalty of our sin. The debt we owed <clears throat> for our sin was eternal suffering and death. It was a debt we couldn't pay. But God loved us so much that he sent his son to pay for our sins so that we could be forgiven, healed, and our relationship with God be restored. So he went in now to Jerusalem to pay the price for our sins. And there's a great scripture that describes this, and it's in Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 6. This scripture was written 700 years before Jesus ever came. It was describing what Jesus would do. And now we already know that Jesus actually did it. In Isaiah 53, look what it says. The fact is, it, is our it was our suffering he took on himself. What did he take? Who's suffering? Do you realize this, that when, and we know this, that the more we live our lives our own way, the more we suffer? The more we live a life of sin, the more pain we have. And have you realized this, that when you're hurting, you hurt people? So a lot of us in this room, you're suffering, not necessarily just because somebody did something to you, you're suffering because of the decisions you've made. And there's deep pain in your heart. I have good news for you. You need to stop beating yourself up and it's time for you to receive forgiveness. It's time for you to forgive yourself and it's time for you to realize Jesus paid the price for every wrong thing you've done so you can end that in internal suffering. What do you do with all that pain? This is what we do. Look at this. He bore our pain. But we thought that God was punishing him. That God was beating him for something he did. But he was being punished for what we did. He was, cru he was crushed because of our guilt. He took the punishment we deserved. And this brought us peace. We were healed because of his pain. We had all wandered away like sheep. We had gone our own way and yet the Lord put all our guilt on him. All our guilt. If you're in this room and you have no peace, if you're in this room and you're full of guilt, like you don't know what I've done even this weekend. I feel like I failed myself. I failed God. I failed my family. Jesus already went through all that suffering. Stop allowing, I'm going to even say this, allowing the devil to make you pay for something Jesus already paid for. If you let Jesus pay for it, this is what God is saying. He'll bring you peace in your soul. He'll give you rest in your sleep. There's going to be a sense of well-being that's in you that you've never had. Because what's missing in your life is a relationship with God. You don't need another rule to obey. You need a God that comes in and gives you his peace. We're not peaceful inside. And that's why we take drugs. We have pain. We have to drink. We're angry. 
we got to take it out on others. Why? There's a war within you. And the only one that could fix that war within you, it's not a church, it's not a religion. His name is Jesus Christ. You can be fixed inside. He did all that to set you free, to set me free. He understands that sin leads to misery. But you no longer need to live a miserable life. Jesus already paid the full price for every wrong thing you've ever done. It's kind of like this. Why keep paying a bill that's already been paid? The bill's been paid, so why are you paying for it still? Do you know that you owed something you couldn't pay anyways? I give an example for a server, but let's think about this. Let's say you have a real credit, big credit card problem. And the banks were dumb enough to give you a $2 million credit line. <laughs> and then you, and you start saying, man, I got some debt. I go, really? And I'm thinking, you know, maybe 10000 And I go, how much? You say, $2 million. <laughs> And it's on a credit card. Okay. And I go, well, okay, okay, okay. Well, let's, whew. All right. You owe $2 million on a credit card. Yeah, I do. And, and, how, and how did you get to $2 million? I mean, what did you buy? Well, I just nonsense, drugs. <laughs> I went gambling, just put it up there and... I just, I, I just bought myself a whole bunch of nonsense. So two million, you have anything to show for it? Nothing. But pain and suffering. I go, okay, okay, well, let's, let's trigger it out of the way. Maybe we can find a way to pay this in a lifetime. What's the interest rate? And then you say 98% interest. I go, what'd you say? Hey, the credit card, they gave me two million, but it's 98% interest. I go, do you know how much 98% interest is every single month? You know, every month you're going to be paying $1.9 million interest or something like that. <laughs> I, yeah, and then you say, you know, but I've been paying $10 a month though. <laughs> and I would tell you, do you know next month you're not going to owe $2 million? You're going to probably owe more, more like $4 million or, or two. Maybe 2.3 million. I don't know. You guys are in the banking industry. You know how it works. But the whole idea, you're not going to owe what you owe this. The idea is you owe a debt you can't pay. And no matter how much you put against that debt, you don't have what it takes to pay it. And what God is saying, you owe a debt that you could not pay. So I send my son to pay the debt that you could not pay. And I erased it off your record. It's paid for. You know what religion does? Religion makes you pay for something Jesus already paid for. Some of us in this room, you're too religious to enjoy your relationship with God. You can't enjoy God because you're still trying to pay something Jesus already paid for. You're trying to prove you could pay it. And the more you try to pay it, the more miserable you are. And this is what you do. This is how we know we're too religious. We're always looking at what we do instead of looking at what God did through his only son. It's not what you do. It's what Christ did. You can't save you, but Jesus can save you. He covers all the debt, all the punishment, all the sins. Not some of them, but all of them. And when God forgives you, he forgives you and he erases it. Not only is it forgiven, it's off your record as if you never owed it. I love it. Not only does he forgive you, then he gives you Jesus credit. I like Jesus credit. You know what Jesus credit means? Everything Jesus qualifies for, I qualify for. 
So now, no longer did they put up my bureau with all the jacked up collection accounts. They pull up Jesus credit. So when I am praying, I don't pray in Marco's name. I don't pray in Mary's name. I don't pray in Peter's name. I pray in Jesus name. And whatever he qualifies for, I get. Could it be that you don't have faith to pray because you keep putting your record in front of Jesus's record? And if you're trying to get Jesus credit on your credit, you're always going to pray with no faith. Jesus paid it all. Now, you know what I love about this? He paid it all. You know what that means? It's forgiven and it's forgotten. This is good news. Someone say good news. So why did he go to Jerusalem? Because he loved us. Why did he go to Jerusalem? Because there was no other way to save us from the penalty of our sin. And there is penalty for sin. And that's the issue. Right now, let's think about this. There's someone that died. They stood before God. And they never, ever placed their faith in Jesus. That means they never trusted Jesus to pay the price for all their sins. So they died without forgiveness. They died without faith in Christ. They died rejecting the opportunity to be saved and forgiven and set free from the judgment that's coming on sin. And that person is alive. And they're right now separated from God forever, suffering in pain with no way out. There are, they are in a real hell. While you're sitting in this chair, someone's reality is hell. They're there. They're screaming. They're crying. They're suffering. They're praying. But there's no answer. Because the time to be saved, the time to place our faith in Jesus Christ is right now while you have breath in your lungs. You know this, that apart from Christ, you're empty, you're suffering, you're hurting, you're hurting people, and you're wondering, how am I going to get out of this? How can I relieve this pain? And that's why we're living in a society that's becoming more dark every single day. It was three weeks ago that a man went into massage parlors and killed, I think, eight women. He went in there and gunned them down. I'm a, at massage parlors. And someone asked him, why did you do it? He goes, I had a sexual addiction and I figured the only way I could overcome it is by killing them. What he was trying to do was set himself free from a condition of sin that only, that only, that only Christ could set him free from. Today, I got good news for you that if you're suffering, if you're in pain and you feel guilty and you're ashamed of your past, there's a God today that can set you free, that can restore you, give you eternal life and give you peace in your soul. But his name is Jesus. And the last thing I want to say, 
Why would Jesus go to Jerusalem if he knew he had to suffer and die? Because he wanted to forgive us of our sins and restore his relationship with us. God wants a relationship with you. Can you say with me? God wants a relationship with me. When Jesus left the earth, he said this, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. What he's saying is my mission is that you'll be with me now and you'll be with me forever. This morning, I talked to a young lady that my daughter brought to church and my daughter met her at the corner bakery yesterday and she invited her to church. And she told me yesterday, I invited one of the workers there at the corner bakery to church. She says she's coming. That young lady came to church and she got here at 7.30 in the morning. 7.30 in the morning. And she began to say this, I have so much pain, so much hurt from my past. I talked to her right after the first service and, I, and my daughter brought her to introduce her to me, her new friend. And she brought her to the room. She goes, I have so much pain and suffering because of my life and the abuse and the things I've gone through. And she says, I know you said that if I receive Jesus, I don't go to hell and I get to go to heaven. But she says something that was way more important. She goes, I'm not really majorly concerned about that. She goes, but what I need is a relationship with God. I need peace in my soul. That's what I need more than anything. And I go, honey, you hit it. You hit the nail on the head. The relationship is more important than anything in the world. And if you have a relationship with God, you get everything else. Do you want to receive Christ as your savior? And she says, I'm ready. Let's do it right now. As she gave her life to Jesus. And the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5.18, God, God has done all of this. He has restored our relationship with him through Christ. Restored our relationship with him. And has given us this ministry of restoring relationships. In other words, God is using Christ to restore his relationship with humanity. He didn't hold people's faults against them. He didn't hold people's faults against them. He didn't hold people's faults against them. He forgave them. And he has given us this message of restored relationships to tell others. This is all about God wanting a relationship with you. And once he establishes a relationship with you, you have an assignment. Go out there and tell them that God wants a relationship with them. We have a ministry of restoration. We as believers should be the best people in the whole world when it comes to relationships. How many believe we should be good at relationships? Because to be good at relationships, you know what you have to be good at? Forgiving people. So this week, do your part in the ministry. Go out there and invite someone for Easter. Write down 10 names, pray over those 10 names, invite 10 names, bring them to church next week. Attend the services, do your part, worship the Lord, and then bring some friends so they could hear the good news of Jesus Christ and be saved. How many believe this is all good news on Palm Sunday? Now this whole week, we're gonna be celebrating what Christ has done. He entered Jerusalem on Sunday, and then we're gonna see the story unfold even in our devotionals uh, this week. So take a look at that. You'll see the story unfold on what Jesus went through for every one of us. Let's all stand up. How many received something from God today? God loves you. So why did he go? He loved me. Why did he come to Jerusalem? To pay the price for the penalty of my sins. And number three, he came to forgive me and restore his relationship with me. And that's all God wants is a relationship with you. Today's your day. Before we leave this place, I'm going to dismiss in just a second. But these are the most important two minutes of your life or this service. Because this is an opportunity for every one of us to place our faith in Jesus Christ and be forgiven of every one of our sins 
and receive the free gift of eternal life. Now, how do you come to Christ? You come to Christ the way you are. In your pain, in your hurt, in your loneliness, and maybe the addiction, in the dysfunction, you just come to Christ. He's the one that's gonna save you. Some of us are so tired, you're worn out. I would even say this, you're trying too hard. You've been beating yourself up. And God says, come. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light, come. Let me show you my ways. There's some of us in this room that you need to recommit your life to the Lord today. Recommit to that relationship with God. When the scripture says we've all walked away, some of us have wandered away. But today, God brought you back. And you're here. And he's not, he's not here to put you down. He's here to save you. He's here to make you whole. He's here to forgive you. He wants a relationship with you. And it could start today. And you use the faith you got. You don't need to know a lot. You just have to know this. I need to be saved. I'm going to ask another question. And I want you to ask yourself this question. If today were your last day on earth and you were standing before God and this would be your judgment day, are you sure that you'd be with God forever and have eternal life? Or maybe you're saying, Pastor, I don't, I don't think I'm right with God, but I want to make peace with God right now. Understand, Jesus already did it. All you have to do is, your part is believe and say yes. Your part is what? Believe and just say yes. And then this is what God will do. He'll forgive you. He'll set you free. And then his spirit will come and live inside of you. You'll become a brand new person. God wants to be so close to you, he wants to live in you. Wow. And once you got Christ in you, you can say this, greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. What are you saying is, the one that's in me is greater than anything I'm facing in this world. That's powerful. Today's your day. Bow your heads and close your eyes for a second. Say, Pastor, that's me. I want to recommit my life to Jesus. Or I'm not sure that I'm right with God and I want to give my life to Jesus, place my faith in Jesus. I want to accept his forgiveness, accept eternal life, accept the new beginning. I realize he paid the price for my sins and I want to accept that. I want a new start, a new beginning. When I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. It takes a real man and woman to say, yes, Jesus died for you publicly. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand when I count to three. This is your moment. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. I see people come in this place within 24 hours. They go into eternity. Some were ready, some were not, but they got an opportunity. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. This is your moment. Don't play Russian roulette with your future. If you're not sure you're right with God, give your life to Jesus. If you're suffering and you're pain and you got a broken heart and you feel the guilty and the shame, don't leave here that way. Be forgiven. Be whole. Have a new start. Let Jesus save you. One, I, this is for people. I want you to raise your hand if you want to recommit your life to the Lord or you want to give your life to Jesus. You want eternal life. You want forgiveness. You want to place your faith in Christ. And on, online too. Two, and when I say three, quickly raise your hands on the building. Raise your hands real quick when, you're, when I say three. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to recommit my life to the Lord. One, two, three. Raise your hands all over this building. I see the hand there. I see the hand there, honey. Proud of you. Proud of you. Proud of you. Proud of you. I see the hand. Anybody else? This is your day. I see the hand over there. I see the hand. Those two hands over there. Anybody else? Anybody? Way in the back. I see the hand. Come on, it takes a real man or woman to say yes to God. I want those that raise their hands. I want you to give me this privilege and honor. I want to pray with you. 
I want to pray with you. So what I want you to do is take your first step of following Jesus. I want you to leave your seat and I want you to come up here and we're just going to do a quick prayer. This is a sign that I'm done my whole life. I want to give my life. I'm tired of the hurt. I'm tired of the pain. I'm tired of hurting myself. I'm tired of hurting others. I want to be saved. I want a new relationship. I want some peace in my life. Who gets it? Those that say yes. Who gets it? If you want to go up there, I'll go up there with you. Ask your neighbor. If you want to go up there, I'll go up there with you. Church, let's clap right now. This is super important. Come on, someone's family, someone's mama, someone's daughter, someone's brother, sister is giving their life to Jesus. of every one of you. Now, there are people up here that today you came up here and you've been wanting to die because you felt so hopeless. This is what God's saying. You're not going to die. You're going to live. I have a purpose for your life. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to give you a brand new beginning. And I'll tell you this, he'll never leave you. Some of us in this place right now, in this right here, someone, uh, someone betrayed you, someone left you, you're broken hearted. But God's going to heal your heart and he'll never leave you. And as long as you have Christ, you're good. Come on. As long as you have Christ, you're good. And this is what you're going to do. You're going to grow and you're going to succeed and you're going to overcome. And that person that left, they're going to realize, man, I messed up. Yeah, you did. Because I'm better without you right now. I'm doing good. I give my life to Jesus. Okay? Let's pray together. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, paid the price for all your sins, and you believe you rose from the dead, and you confess it with your mouth, you'll be saved. Are you ready to give your life to Jesus? Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, forgive me for all my sins. I realize that I've sinned against you but you paid the price by dying on the cross and I believe you rose from the dead for me you are alive I believe you love me and want a relationship with me and I say yes I open my heart Jesus come in and fill me now with your Holy Spirit today I'm forgiven I'm free I'm saved I have eternal life from this day forward I will follow you for the rest of my life in Jesus name I pray amen let's give the Lord a big hand guys